As many of you know, my birthday was just recently, last Saturday actually, and uh, Benedict got me this mug along with some other things. Uh, I turned 70, so I guess I'm officially an old geezer now. I asked somebody if I was an old geezer. He said, no, you're a young geezer. So old or young, I'm still a geezer. <laughs> but I was thinking about some of the, the ways our nation has changed and some of the uh, ways that uh, we are so different today than we were then. Uh, and uh, I, th on this mug, it's got... Uh, different uh, little bits of information about things that were going on in 1953. Uh, one of the famous songs from then was That's Amore. That's one that we probably still know today. Most people would. The popular movies would be Peter Pan, Shane, and The Robe, along with a couple of others. I think, it doesn't say here, but I think Dwight Eisenhower would have been the president of the United States back then, 1953. And then it re really gets crazy when you look at what things cost. A new home would cost about $16,000. Boy, I'd buy a couple of them if I could get them at that, at that uh, price. Uh, average income, $4,200 per year. Well, that, <laughs> that makes a difference. A stamp costs three cents. Gallon of gas, 29 cents. A dozen eggs, 70 cents. And then uh, something that makes me feel pretty good is uh, it lists a couple famous people that were born in 1953. One would be Tim Allen and another Pierce Brosnan. So, uh, hey, I guess I'm in good company there. Anyway, we're not here to talk about that sort of a thing. I just thought I'd throw it in for a bonus. Uh, what I do want to talk about is my own health. Some of you look on me as a mentor. Uh, as kind of a life coach, a health coach. And uh, so you have the right to ask, well, what about you, Dennis? How are you doing? How is your health? So I thought I'd share a little bit about my own health and some of the things going on with me as I have reached the age of three score and 10. That's the way the Bible might put it, 70 years of age. Um, so I wanted to just talk about how I'm doing now. I tested my blood sugar this morning when I woke up, and it was at a 92. I like it better in the 80s, but 92 is not too bad. Uh, my last A1C that I had uh, done officially or even unofficially uh, was at a lab, and it, it turned out to be 5.0, so I felt pretty good about that. My blood pressure, I don't talk much about it. Uh, my blood pressure was good this morning. It was 113 over 70. However, I do take a blood pressure medication uh, off and on. I, well, when I say off and on, what I mean is several times a week. So it's kind of almost an every other day, but uh, lately it's been about four days out of seven. I will take a lisinopril slash hydro something or other. Uh, as a blood pressure. I, I'm kind of at a funny stage where if I take blood pressure medication all the time, uh, it gets too low. But if I don't take it at all, it gets a little high. And I went for maybe a couple of years a while back and didn't take it at all. And then suddenly my ankles started swelling and I tested my blood pressure and it was too high. I think it was like, uh, I don't know, 160 over 98 or something. It, was, it just wasn't real good. So I decided I'd start taking it. And it seemed like if I do it about every other day, it works out pretty well. I, I get kind of envious, I have to admit. Some of you, in fact, many of you tell me that I don't need it at all. Uh, my mom was taking five blood pressure medications daily uh, toward the end of her life. So it runs in my family for sure. My weight this morning was at 166, so pretty much where I want it. I like to keep it under 170. I find that my blood uh, glucose tends to kind of fall in line with my weight. The more I weigh, the higher my fasting glucose is particularly. Uh, the last blood work I had, my and that was uh, quite a few years ago, probably eight, nine years ago. I haven't had a full blood work panel. I've had A1Cs done, but I haven't had the full uh, blood work. And the last one, my uh, cholesterol, total cholesterol was high. They didn't break it down for me. So I, I had no idea whether we're talking 
uh, the the fluffy particles are the dense particles of the LDL. I think it did break it down between HDL and LDL, but it didn't break it the LDL down any further. But it was the total was two forty or something. And my doctor that ordered that panel for me said uh, you need to take a statin. But <laughs> the more I listen to people that I respect, doctors that I respect the more I felt that my dangers of taking a statin were higher than my dangers of living with a higher total cholesterol. And most of the people I respect say that total cholesterol isn't the, the, the whole story or even half the story these days. And there are even some studies that say that once you hit the age of 60, you're much more likely to live longer if you have high cholesterol than if you have low cholesterol. So uh, ideas about cholesterol, studies about cholesterol, they're all over the map and we all have to make our own choice. And I decided I'm not gonna take a statin and I'm not gonna go around eating a bunch of oats thinking I can lower my cholesterol that way. So like in a lot of things in life, you just, you just make your best decision, take your chances, trust in God. So that's what I do with cholesterol. Uh, my eyes, they're good and they're not so good. The, the good thing is there's no, you know, retinal neuropathy. There's no bursting of the blood vessels in the eyes at all. Uh, eye doctors never tell me, oh, you've got diabetes. They would never know it from looking at my eyes. What there is, however, uh, are uh, cataracts in my eyes. I, I was at my eye doctor recently because I had to renew my driver's license. And here in Texas, you do it on your birthday or before your birthday. And I was concerned that I might not be able to pass it if I didn't get some new glasses. So I did, I went to the eye doctor. He took a look at my eyes. He said, well, I can't really get you up to 2020, no matter what lenses I'm using. Uh, he, he looked at it further. He said, you have cataracts. He said, you're gonna need cataract surgery in one or two years. I asked him, well, if I get the cataract surgery, will I then be up to 2020? And he said, yeah, you will. So uh, some of you have uh, told me that you've had cataract surgery. I have not, uh, but it looks like in a year or two, I may be going through that. So if you've got any words of wisdom or encouragement or want to tell your story about how your cataract surgery went, uh, please feel free to share that in the comments. Uh, in terms of diabetic neuropathy, I don't have any of that. I don't have any sores. You know, a lot of people, when you get to a certain age, they, they think it's just natural. You're going to wake up sore in the morning. You're going to have aches and you're going to have pains and you're going to be sore about this and sore about that. You know, you, just your body's just going to tell you, I'm an old man. I don't feel that at all. Just sitting here talking to you, I don't feel a bit different than I did when I was in my 20s. I don't, I don't have aches, I don't have pains, I don't have sores. I rarely get a headache. If I do, it's usually because I changed my <laughs> caffeine routine and didn't drink quite as much coffee as I normally do. But uh, all in all, my health is good. I, I'm mobile, I, I hear well, thank the Lord. And uh, so I just don't really have many issues. In fact, if I were to just stop and think, how old do I feel? Well, I don't, I don't feel any particular age. I feel just fine. There's nothing in the way I feel that tells me I'm an old guy. Now, when I look in the mirror, <laughs> that's a different story. That tells me I'm old for sure, but uh, not the way I feel. So now, is there, you may ask, is there anything related to diabetes that may be a problem for you? The only thing I can think of related to diabetes that, uh, that could be a problem is, is sometimes I get dry fingers or fingertips. And right now, this particular thumb is a bit dry. And sometimes uh, my fingertips will crack, usually not several at a time, it's usually just one. And the way I solve it is I, I get these uh, gloves, these like kind of like surgeon's gloves or doctor gloves, and I, I cut off a finger and I put some lotion in there or some Vaseline and I put it over my finger and I sleep with it. And then when I wake up in the morning, it, it's better, but usually it'll take several days of doing that to, to get it normal. But I do occasionally get that dry skin. I don't get it anywhere else on my body, really. It's just my fingertips and usually just one finger at a time. So wish I didn't have that, but I do. Now, as I have reached the age of 70 and even in my late 60s, 
I have often thought about my mom. I've told you before about mom, but she was a classic diabetic and she ended up having two amputations. But even before her amputations, she had all kinds of procedures. In fact, Linda, my sister and I figured out that probably over the last 15 to 16 years of her life, basically from age 65 through 80, she lived to be 80, she averaged about one procedure or surgery or some kind of a hospital something that went on with her, uh, one per year. So she had like 15, 16 surgeries, procedures. She had an angioplasty. She had uh, artery or vein bypasses. Different things went on. They, they worked and worked on her legs. It was all in her legs. It wasn't in her arms. She didn't have the neuropathy. She did have brittle bones. But the real problem was in her legs, and her legs hurt her uh, a lot. And sometimes the pain would get so strong, she'd go to the doctor, and they'd do another bypass, or they'd do some kind of a procedure. And, and they tried to save her legs for years. This, As I said, this went on from about age 65 through about 74. Now, at age 74, she had her first amputation. So if I were to follow mom's pattern... I'd already be having all kinds of procedures and surgeries and bypass operations to try to save my legs. I've had none of that. I haven't been in the hospital for years and years. And, so, and another thing that mom had was she, it would hurt her to walk any kind of a distance. So to walk across a room was no big deal. But if she were at a mall or at a store of some kind and doing a lot of walking, sometimes she would have to stop and just relax and take it easy for a few minutes to kind of cause the pain to subside. So that was already going on with my mom at age 70. Uh, I've had none of that at all. I could walk for miles, although I might get winded <laughs> and get tired. Uh, I'm not in the best shape, but my legs don't bother me at all. Uh, and like I said, I've had no, uh, no surgeries or procedures at all. So, and I consider myself sort of a carbon copy of my mom. Obviously, she was a woman. I'm a man. Uh, you know, we, we weren't the same uh, physically. But in terms of our metabolic makeup and our tendency toward diabetes, I, felt, I, I have always felt I followed right in her footsteps. My dad never had diabetes. He had uh, normal blood pressure, sometimes it was even low. The doctor told him, you've got the blood pressure of a teenager when he was in his 80s. Uh, mom was the exact opposite, raging high blood pressure, high blood sugar, and all these issues. So I've always felt like I took after my mom metabolically. And yet, because I uh, was helped to, to understand by God what I needed to do. And in mom's day, that information just wasn't available. The only way she could have got it is pretty much from a direct revelation from the Lord. Well, actually, there was uh, Atkins, I think, in her day that might have been able to help toward the latter part. But um, she didn't know a thing about Robert Atkins. So, uh, I, but I often think about mom if... If I followed my mom's footsteps, I would only have four more years before I would, ha I would have to get along on one leg. And within six years from now, at the age of 76, I'd have no legs, or at least no uh, lower legs. So, so far, by the grace of God, I'm doing pretty well. Mom was given advice uh, from her doctor, to, and it was about all they knew to do was to watch her sugar, and I, I just don't like that phrase, watch your sugar. It's not radical enough. You don't want to watch it. You want to slash it. You want to crush it. You want to do away with sugar. And the other thing was lower your fat. Just don't eat much fat at all. So she, she essentially got bad advice. Watch your sugar's okay, but it's not severe enough. And cut out your fats, that's not the issue at all. So she didn't know what to do, and she didn't even follow that totally, but she did cut her fat pretty good. It didn't help at all. Let me say it again. It didn't help at all. I learned back around the year 2002 what I needed to do was quit worrying about fat, Dennis. Quit worrying about fat and cut those carbohydrates. Forget your paranoia of fat. Forget the whole world's paranoia of fat and cut those carbohydrates. Now, in those early days, that's all I knew, and I did it. 
later on, it was actually after I started this channel, I started reading guys like Dr. Jason Fung and others that talked about intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating. And I, I went to that. I went to a two-meal-per-day program separated by about six hours, no snacks in between those two meals. And that kicked me into a higher gear and brought my A1C down more and brought my blood pressure down. In fact, if you watch some of the early videos that I made on this channel and I'm doing some testing, you'll find my numbers aren't that great. And at one point in the one of those early videos, I mentioned I'm pre-diabetic. I think I had a 5.8 A1C. So that's not really anything to be too proud of. And some of the uh, pre-meal tests that I took were like 114, 112, not too good. Uh, but I was doing what I knew. It seemed like when I went to the time-restricted eating and then later I adapted a normal 36-hour fast in the midst of each week, one per week. And I won't say I do it every week, but I do it most weeks. Uh, that helped some more. So mom did live to be 80. And uh, uh, that's a good thing. But she did not... Um, she did not have a high quality of life for those last 15, 16 years. Now, if you want to know my own opinion, my opinion is this. If you can live at least to be 80 with good health, to me, that's kind of the gold standard. That's, that's like you've done very well. Not just live to be 80, but live to be 80 with good health, no neuropathy. Uh, your eyes are not going blind. And uh, your kidneys are fine, your liver is fine, you're very mobile, your mind is sharp. If you can make it to 80 and then after that, well, you know, whatever God gives you. But at least shoot for 80, I would think. And that's been my goal. I actually, I, I kind of, my prayer is, Lord, let me make it to 85. Give me an extra five bonus years so I can do more good, produce more fruit, help more people. Uh, so 85, but at least 80. If I make it to 80, 10 more years, and there's no guarantee. I mean, our lives are in God's hands. Let me just say this. There are no guarantees. I'm not going to sit here and guarantee that if you go to low-carb eating and you do time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting, guarantee you'll make it to 80 in good health. What we're talking about is increasing the likelihood of doing these things, the likelihood of making it to 80 with good health. No guarantee but it becomes more likely. Ultimately, uh, God will determine how long we live and none of us are gonna live forever. So <laughs> if you've got any ideas about that, you can forget that. And uh, it's not like I love this world and I love this life so much I can't stand the thought of leaving, but I do have loved ones that kind of need me around still. And for their sakes and for the sake of doing more good, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to, to, to go beyond the age of 70 if the Lord will grant me those years. One of the, th one of the things that uh, we should be aware of is that when people die of heart attacks, often the, result, uh, the, the reason for that is insulin resistance and or prediabetes and or real diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes affects your heart and increases the likelihood of you having a heart attack and keeling over and dying. And at the age of 70, it's kind of sobering to realize that there's a whole lot of people that make it to 70 that never make it to the next decade. They don't make it to 80. And I just uh, thought uh, I'd go on the internet and look up some of the celebrities that didn't make it to 80. Some never even made it to 70. Uh, and they died of a heart attack. Now, the medical autopsy may not reveal it's diabetes related or it may, but in many cases it won't. It'll just say heart attack. How did you die? Heart attack. But if we could look deeper, we would find that probably many of these, if not most, had metabolic issues high levels of insulin, the type 2 diabetics, and uh, insulin resistance and so forth. So here's a list of some of the famous people that never made it to 80. Bella Lugosi, who played Dracula in a, lot of, um, in a lot of horror stories, he only made it to 73, heart attack. Orville Wright, the guy that invented the airplane, only made it to 76. Roy Campanella, the baseball player, 71. Mark Twain, 74. All these died of heart attacks. Bing Crosby, 74. Lucille Ball, 77. John Candy, 43. Wow. Uh, poor John didn't make it very far. Lou Costello, 
Uh, Abbott and Costello, uh, the comedians. Lou only made it to 52, heart attack. Joan Crawford, 72. Lee Marvin, age 62. Davy Jones of the Monkees. Those of you who are monkey fans, you know who Davy Jones is. He was a singer and guitar player. He made it to 66, died of a heart attack. Don Drysdale, the sidewinding fastball pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodger, died at 56 of a heart attack. Red Fox, if you've ever watched uh, Fox's Sanford and Son, one of the, the comedy uh, little things that they put in almost, seemed like almost every episode was he would fake a heart attack and, and clutch at his heart and say, Elizabeth, who was his wife who had passed on, I'm coming to join you, baby. And he did all these fake heart attacks. Well, he died of a real heart attack. The actor did at the age of 68. So uh, it happens so often. And again, many of them will be diabetes related. Well, of course, we're all going to take our turn. One of these days, you're going to hear, did you, someone's going to say, did you hear about Dennis Pollock? Yeah, he's gone. He died. Uh, and it's going to be said of everybody uh, sooner or later. I think about the, uh, the movie Saving a Private Ryan. And it costs men's lives for them to go in and rescue Private Ryan and save him. And people died trying to rescue this man. But they finally did. They rescued him. But several were dead. And Tom Hanks, who plays Captain Miller, said to him as he was dying, Captain Miller was supposedly dying, he said, earn this. In other words, make good use of your life. It costs people's lives for you to be free today. Well, I don't believe we really can earn the grace of God. I mean, grace by its very nature is something that's given as a gift, but we can show gratitude. If God has helped you to beat diabetes, is God, if God extends your life and you end up not living it to 55 or 65, but to 85, then be thankful and out of your gratitude, do good for some people. Find something to do or whatever you can do, but do some good for somebody. So anyway, that's my State of the Union address or State of the Health of Dennis address at the age of 70. Uh, will I make it to 80? Only God knows that. But by his grace, I'll carry on as long as he gives me to live. If you've recently been diagnosed with diabetes and you've just discovered this channel, let me recommend that you go to our uploads page, which will give you access to every diabetic video we've posted since we began. As you work your way through all our videos, I believe you'll find the help you need. A link to our uploads page is in the description.